I get started on the back table there are some papers and it says what we believe we started this process last Sunday night uh, we're going to put on our website eight uh, beliefs that we think people need to know this is what we believe and we started discussing those last Sunday night we'll finish that hopefully uh, tonight and so I invite you back at six o'clock to participate if you're not going to be here or you want to know, the papers are on the back table. What we believe is the headline for it, okay? And so I wanted you to be aware of that. Paul Everett was 27 years old and out to make a name for himself in the advertising industry when he joined Macy's department store. He was ambitious and he was very, very driven. But after a while in that job, his ambition stalled. And he would wake up some mornings feeling like he'd lost sense of himself. Uh, all the goals that he had had now felt like traps for him. He was depressed, and he was scared, and he couldn't figure out why that he felt the way that he did. One day at work, he had a message that, he was to, that one of the senior vice presidents wanted to talk to him. Uh, her name was Ellie Summer. And so he went to her office, but instead of talking about business, she said to him, Paul, I've been praying for you. He wasn't really sure he heard her correctly. Did I, I'm sorry, did, did you say you were praying? And Ellie responded by saying, I've been watching you, Paul. There's something missing in your life. A plan. A plan that's much bigger than you. A plan that includes the Lord. And at that moment, Paul knew that not only was his life going to be changed, but that he was going to be fundamentally and forever transformed. Not too long after that, he gave his life to the Lord. And not too long after that, he left the industry. And for the next 40 years, he served as a minister in a Protestant denomination. And then he retired. Not too long after he retired, he began to feel a sense of spiritual restlessness. And so he went for a retreat to a Franciscan hermitage in southwestern Pennsylvania. One of the monks there especially stood out to him. Oh, that's Brother Jim, one of the other priests told him. He's been a powerful force here ever since they let him out of jail. He offered no other explanation. On one of his uh, other visits to the uh, retreat center, he sat down at the table with a group of men it, where Jim was. It was obvious to Paul ever that Jim had a certain sense of holiness and that God was really at work in that man's life. But what had he done to deserve time in prison? It must have been something that was relatively minor. So he asked the monastery's leader why he had been in prison. And the priest told him that it was public knowledge and that he had been away for 20 years. A man doesn't go to prison for that long without having done something awful, perhaps even unforgivable. So the monastery leader went on and said, when he was 20, Jim murdered his wife. After several weeks, the leader of the monastery came to Paul Everett and asked him to write Jim's story. It was to be a huge undertaking that would eventually turn into a book. Paul was 72 years old at the time, but he agreed to do it. And he spent the next couple of years with Jim, getting to know him. And Jim's honesty was jarring, even brutal, but it had to be that way for his story to be told. He made no excuses about his life. He, his was a childhood of horrible abuse. And then a young marriage to a girl no more educated in how to live than he was. A year into the marriage, convinced that she was drawing away from him like everyone else had in his life, he and Jim was overcome in a moment by rage and violence. He lashed out and he ended his life almost as surely as he ended his wife's. In prison, he met a chaplain who told him his life was not over. God had a plan. With God, he could find a way through the guilt and the horror of his past, and into the holy light of forgiveness. With God, he could be free, but only 
with God. Jim fought it. He wanted no part of God or of religion or of the Bible, but that meeting with the chaplain would turn out to be the beginning of Jim's new life. Paul Everett would later say that they were both had been prisoners. Their sins were distance that were different, but the distance that they kept from God wasn't. The distance was measured in the absence of grace. That grace, when we allow it in our lives, Paul said, is transforming. Grace is the key. It can unlock the door of any prison. I have found over the years that a lot of people who consider themselves Christians, but in whom there is an absence of of grace. Think about you, your own life, for a moment. Many Christians, even though they will say they have been saved by grace, continue to live in some kind of self-imposed prison. But that is not at all how God wants us to live. And Paul Everett was right. Grace is the key that can unlock any prison door. And so as we turn to our text of Scripture this morning, ask yourself this question. What is my prison? Can you put a name to your prison? In what are you imprisoned right now? As you think about that, turn in your Bible in the New Testament to Galatians chapter 5, one verse, the first verse. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And there are two things in this verse that we need to understand this morning. And so let's read that verse together. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, you can look on the wall behind me. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, stand firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Stand firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. We're going to take the first part of that verse first. Now, as we all know, freedom is a precious thing. Hundreds of wars have been fought over this very issue alone. In 1864, the year that the Emancipation Proclamation uh, became uh, went into effect, an Alabama slave was asked what he thought of the great emancipator. And he replied, I don't know nothing about Abraham Lincoln, except they say that he set us free, and I don't know nothing about that neither. And tragically, there are a lot of Christians, for that's true. That even though Jesus has set us free on the cross, they know absolutely nothing in terms of what that means. And so in this verse that we read a moment ago, Paul used the word freedom, and in the original text, it has with it the definite article, and so it should be translated, the freedom. Jesus set us free. His death on the cross brings about the freedom. What does he mean by that? Well, in the previous chapters, Paul spent a considerable amount of time talking about slavery and freedom, but he wasn't talking about physical slavery and freedom but a spiritual slavery and freedom. He is not talking, though, about some pie-in-the-sky abstract abstract construct of freedom, but more a more specific kind of freedom. He's talking about the freedom that Christ died to bring about in our lives. Christ has set us free, he says, tells us that salvation is to be understood in terms of freedom. Okay, but freedom from what? Now, if I was playing what word association game with you this morning, and I said the word freedom, what word in association would come to your mind? Now, I realize that some of us are a bit more weird than others, but what word would come to your mind? For some of you, the word slavery would naturally come to mind. For others, maybe the word bondage would come to your mind. But then again, Slavery to what? Bondage to what? Well, obviously the main thing is sin. We're all enslaved by it. We're all shackled by it. 
and we're all imprisoned by it. When I was a youth minister a long time ago, in a place called England, Arkansas, where I coached high school football and basketball, it only took one year for me to know that was not my life's calling, but anyway, I was a youth minister, and that summer, I wanted to take our, our guys, I wanted to take our guys uh, to play softball five miles down the road, road to the penitentiary, state penitentiary, five miles down the road. Well, I almost got fired over that. The parents were horrified that I would want to take their kids into a prison. And I had to conjole and argue and go see every parent. And my kids were scared too, by the way. They were, no kidding, they were literally scared that they would get there and the prisoners would exchange their uniforms for their own. And they, they would never leave the prison. But I guess somehow we finally got there. And I remember driving through the gates of that prison. And above it, there was this forbidding sign that said, Department of Corrections, Tucker Unit, or Tucker Prison. So think about the prison that we're in this way. A huge edifice, gigantic, with bold letters that says, Sin Prison. It is as real as that prison in Tucker, Arkansas. We've all been inmates and some, many, are still incarcerated yet. Sin is our prison. And Satan is the warden. Anyone who does not understand that, who does not see that, is blind and still enslaved. And so the Bible teaches us that our condition is that of being sinners. And that is our nature. And the nature of sin is to enslave us. That's sin's nature. To make us slaves to our sin. The prison of sin holds us all. There's no possible escape. And many people will die in that prison. Now inside this prison, there are much smaller prisons. Call them isolation wards or punishment cells like solitary confinement. Let me just name a few of these smaller, darker, more squalid prisons in which many people find themselves in today. The most obvious sub-prison is guilt. That may be a prison that you find yourself in today. Guilt. You're imprisoned by it. But then there's the prison of failure. You failed at something. And it's really got your life turned upside down. Then there's the prison of the past. Something in your past still has such a hold on you that it imprisons you. The prison of perfectionism, feeling like you have to do everything perfectly. The prison of needing approval. By the way, in America, this is a big prison. There are a lot of people that go through life always feeling like they need approval and always trying to get it. Then there's the prison of obligation. And finally, there's the prison of religion. And religion can be a prison. And the second part of this verse that we'll get to in a moment, that is exactly what the Apostle Paul is going to talk about. So what is your personal prison? What's yours today? Whatever there it is, there is only one power on earth that can set you free. And that power is grace. Randy Neighbors was a prison fellowship uh, seminar instructor and volunteer. And he was at a southern penitentiary. He had finished his seminar for the night. And so it was late at night. He was going over his notes for the next night's seminar when a state-employed psychiatrist knocked on his door. He was there on one of his routine visits to the prison. And soon the frustrated doctor was describing his day's cases. And this is what he said. I'll tell you, Reverend, I can cure somebody's madness but I can do nothing for their badness. Psychiatry properly administered can turn a schizophrenic bank robber into a mentally healthy bank robber, and a good teacher can turn an illiterate criminal into an educated criminal, but they're still bank robbers and criminals. And he's absolutely right. Only grace can remove the sin component in our lives 
that keeps us from being what God wants us to be. Only grace. It's the only power on earth that can take folks who do evil, foul their lives up, who do sin, and who leave in their wake a trail of debris of destruction. Only grace can change us. It's the only power that can. Grace frees us so that we can become what God originally created to be. Grace frees us so that we can become all that God meant for us to be. Grace shatters the shackles that binds us and releases us from the bondage that holds us. Only when we experience grace are we truly free. Now, that brings us to the second part of this verse. If you have your Bible or if you look on the board, notice the second part. You see, many Christians, having been set free by grace, return to another prison, consciously or, un or unconsciously, choosing to be imprisoned again. And Paul says in the second part of this verse, don't do that. Don't return to slavery. Don't get a yoke of slavery again. And here in this second verse, here's what he says. Stand firm in the freedom that you have, and therefore do not be loaded down again with a yoke of slavery. What's he talking about? Well, the Apostle Paul was specifically referring to a group of people who were going around telling Christians that even though that they have been, may have been saved by Jesus Christ, and even though grace may have been played a part in that, there were still some things they had to do to be right with God. Mostly, these were Jewish converts to Christianity who believed that people who were not Jews had to literally become Jews, be circumcised, and that they had to follow all the rules and regulations of Judaism in order to be right with God. They had allowed this religious group of people to calm them into this idea, and therefore they were going into another kind of prison, the bondage of religion. Now in our churches today, it can be every, any number of things. You've probably heard it as I have. People in churches will say, now that you're a Christian, you have to do this, or you need to do this, in order to keep God's favor. There are even some people who say, yes, we're saved by grace, but you have to do this, or you have to do that. Some people believe that, well, yes, we're saved by grace, but if you don't get baptized, you're not really saved. Let me tell you something. Anyone who tells you that you have to do something to either earn God's favor or keep God's favor is lying. That's the very definition of grace. There isn't anything you can or have to do to earn God's favor. That's why Jesus died on the cross. He earned God's favor for all of us. And the Bible calls this grace. And the lie that you have to do something is one that we can ill afford to believe. Being set free really does mean be free once and forever, never to be enslaved again. Now, one big reason why people who have been saved by grace, they've experienced grace in their own life, but then turn to a, another form of bondage, the bondage of religion, of obligation, of going through the motions of do's and don'ts, is because it's familiar. And it makes us feel comfortable, even secure. A convict who was serving a life sentence in a Texas penitentiary for rape and murder said, I wouldn't trade places with, these, with those people on the outside for anything. In here, I don't have to think about anything. What time I have to get up or what I'm going to eat for the next meal, every day is planned for me. Why would I want to trade that for the worry and the anxiety outside these walls? And there are a lot of people who come to faith in Christ have the same attitude. I don't want to have to think about anything. I don't want to have to invest in the relationship with Jesus Christ. Just tell me what to do. Tell me how to behave, and I'll just follow that, and that's all I want. And when you do that, you've jettisoned grace, and you've bought into the bondage 
of religion. Sad to say, some prisons can become bearable, even downright comfortable, if you stay in them long enough. Russian novelist Dostoevsky wrote in one of his novels that Christ came back again and that the Grand Inquisitor, recognizing him, has him thrown into jail. And he visits the Christ at night in secret. And he says to him, Why have you come to interfere with us? People don't want freedom. They want security. And the neurotic comfort of rules rather than freedom. With freedom comes responsibility and people don't know what to do with it. They would rather not have to make decisions so we do it for them. And this is why people who come to know Christ in His grace soon settle into the religion of obligation and you have to do this and you have to do that. Rules are more comforting. They're more secure than investing in a daily relationship with Jesus in which you have to depend on Him for everything. In such a relationship, there are too many variables. There are too many ups and downs. And you might have to work at that relationship. It's simply easier to mindlessly follow the rules. Walking with Jesus, on the other hand, means you might be surprised. You might be stretched. You might be challenged. You might even have to, ye gads, think. And I know a lot of Christians, they quit thinking a long time ago. Every day, though, with Jesus is a new day. Life with Jesus becomes an adventure. And sometimes you may not know where it's leading. But that's what part of grace is. But it doesn't really matter. If you don't know where it's leading because the one who makes it all happen does. Religion may make people feel more secure. But it isn't very interesting. And it certainly isn't very exciting. And it's very, very Confining. With religion, it's all spelled out for you. Just follow the rules, follow the list, you know, do all the things that you're supposed to do, the prescribed ways of outward behavior. It doesn't matter whether your heart's as dark and dirty as it can be. Just follow the outward rules of behavior. And there are a lot of Christians who have bought into that, and they're in the prison of religion. In fact, if they've ever been set free by the grace of Jesus Christ in the first place. A lady in the Deep South married her childhood sweetheart. And while their life together was not absolutely perfect, whose is? They were devoted to each other and they had a rewarding, faithful, joyous relationship for many years. And then a sudden heart attack took him from her not being able to part with him visibly. This is a real story, by the way. I didn't make this up. The widow decided to have him embalmed, put him in a glass case, and then put him right inside the front door in the foyer as you came into the house. Now think about that. I mean, if you can get that picture, just think about that, okay? Uh, of her large plantation home. And so every day... When she walked through the door, she would smile, and she'd look over and she'd say, Hi, John, how are you today? And then she'd walk on down back to the house or up the stairs, and, and this went on month after month. And there he sat day after day, and she would acknowledge him with a smile and with a wave. And a year after her, she, he died, she decided to take a trip to Europe, a lengthy trip. And it was a wonderful change of scenery for her. And while in Europe, she met a fine American gentleman who was also there on vacation. He swept her off her feet. They had a whirlwind romance. They married, and they honeymooned all over Europe. She had said nothing about old John back at the family farm. And so the happy couple returned to the States. And driving up the winding road to her home, the groom thought to himself, this is the moment 
when I will lift my bride over the threshold and carry her back into her home and the wonderful place where we will live together for many years. He picked her up, he bumped the door open with his hip, and he walked right in and almost dropped his bride to the floor. He looked over and he said, Who is this? And the woman looked over and says, Oh, he's my old man from... He's history. He's dead. And so her new husband went out in the backyard, dug a big hole in the ground, buried her former old man in it, glass case and all. Now, that's kind of a vivid story of what Jesus did on the cross. When He buried the old man, the sin-enslaved persons that we once were, chained to the desires and the thoughts of the way of sin, Jesus buried that old thing. And baptism is a powerful symbol of that old way of life in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. We need to say the same thing that that southern lady said to her new husband about her deceased husband. He's dead. We need to say that about our old way of lives before Jesus. The old way of life that we once were, slaves to sin, is dead. The new life, the new way of life, free from sin's bondage, is now alive and well. But, as the second part of this verse indicates to us, we're also freed from something almost as deadly. Dry, formal, life-sucking religion. Mind-numbing, soul-stealing, useless religion that is a poor substitute for the real thing, a daily living relationship with a loving, powerful sustaining God. The God who has set us absolutely and totally free. So, we dare not listen to the chief slaveholder, Satan, and either sell our soul into the bondage of sin, or having been set free of that form of slavery, we must equally not fall into the trap of being enslaved by religion without grace. Jesus Christ has set you free. Live in Him. Live with Him. Or, as the Apostle said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Live in His freedom. It's not a license to sin. It's a license to live. Free. Let's pray. Dear Father, I come to You and I thank You for the freedom that I enjoy by walking with You daily in Your grace. Your grace has taught me that You accept me as I am. You probably don't like some of the things that I do or don't do but I never have to doubt your love for me. That's what grace does. In Jesus Christ, you have set me free from my prisons. And I pray, Lord, on a daily basis that you will so live in me and my life will be so lived through you that I will never return to any form of bondage because any form of bondage is not having a relationship with you. I thank you that having a daily relationship with you may involve some work, may leave us feeling a little bit insecure about where you want us to go, what you want us to do, but that's where faith comes into play. We have to actually exercise faith. But nothing can be a substitute grace. Grace is the only power that can change us. May we live freely in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.